G'day guys, today we're talking about arguably the events that occurred around a particular individual that have shaped events in Western Europe specifically, but the globe overall, ever since they occurred in 1066. Today we're going to talk about Edward the Confessor. That's coming up. Edward the Confessor, King of England, one of the last true Anglo-Saxon kings. Uh, we'll talk about Harold Godwin in a, in a different video, but Edward the Confessor, goodness me. Um, I, I, I think as much as anything, events simply occurred around the side of this person who, who he just had no ability to control, or at least a lack of preparation and a lack of, what can you say, um, ability and willingness to control some of those events when he did have the resources to influence the outcomes. Rightio, let's get into it. Edward the Confessor, or the man who became known as Edward the Confessor, is the seventh son of Athelred the Unready, or Athelred the Ill-Advised, and his wife at the time, Emma of Normandy. Emma of Normandy, we're going to be doing a whole video on her separately. She's an incredible woman, um, not necessarily for what she did, but uh, very ambitious, very strategic, very tactful, um, and very tenacious as a woman. And definitely, I think, one of the women who created the outcome uh, for England. We don't know. Um, it, it's so interesting, isn't it? The, the stuff that we don't know about the medieval period. We know so much about history today. History today is filmed, let's face it, we've all got a camera uh, with our smartphones. It's, it's crazy. We record everything. Uh, and, and even we don't really realise what we're recording half the time. We don't know what year, let alone what month, uh, Edward the Confessor was born sometime between 1003 and 1005. And he was one of seven sons and his sons are always in front of him when described in books like the um, Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. His brother uh, Alfred the Atheling and sister Goda. Alright, we'll talk about them a little bit later. England at the time was the target of um, successive, very aggressive and very strategic raids uh, by, specifically led by Sven Falkbeard and the man uh, to be known as Canute the Great. We'll be doing videos on these guys separately. Okay, without concentrating too much on Sven Falkbeard or Canute, essentially what happened was Edward was forced to flee to Normandy uh, to survive really. If nothing else could be achieved by these Viking raids, if they could eliminate the English leadership at the time, or the, then they could justify themselves taking over the English throne. And that's kind of how things worked in, the, in those days. Sven however died in February 1014. Athelred was invited back by the Witan providing that he ruled more justly. But then Athelred died shortly after in April 1016 and was succeeded by Edmund Ironside. Scandinavian sagas tell of uh, Edward fighting Canute alongside Edmund Ironside. However, Edmund, uh, however, Edward at the time was at best 13 years old so that's very unlikely. Edmund Ironside died in November 1016 and ruled for only seven months. Canute 
then became king and Edward the Confessor was then exiled. He spent, roughly speaking, 25 years in exile, mostly in Normandy, but also in, in other areas of France. Um, we don't know precisely where. If you think about it, um, if, if someone is going to spend years in exile, that costs a great deal of money, especially when you're talking about um, a foreign statesman. They have to be maintained at a particular level. Um, you have to be able to give them not only protection, but clothing and food and everything else that goes with it, accommodation, all of that needs to get paid for. And so this is an expensive exercise. And it's fair to say that the French would have expected something in return. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, William, Duke of Normandy, comes into this. Okay, supported by his sister, God for you, uh, married Drogo of Monthia. All right, I'm getting my pronunciation all kinds of wrong there. I do apologize. I don't speak old English. So anyway, according to William of Gimierge, Robert I, Duke of Normandy, attempted to invade England, but was blown off course to Jersey in around somewhere 1034. William of Gimierge became very good friends, apparently, with Edward the Confessor quite early on. And the two of them had uh, a very close relationship in fact, so close that um, William of Gimierge could basically say, you know, that's a red brick over there, when in fact it was black, and Edward the Confessor would have agreed with William of Gimierge. Uh, Edward had the support of at least four abbots, including Abbot Robert of Normandy, uh, that is the Abbot of Gimierge. Edward then later goes on to make Robert of Chimierge, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Canute dies in 1035. This is where Emma of Normandy sort of comes into it quite a lot. Hearth Canute succeeds Canute as King of Denmark, but there's a lot of internal struggle in Scandinavia at this time. And we'll talk about that more in different videos. Harold Harefoot is placed as Regent to the Crown in England. And Emma held on to Wessex. That's Emma of Normandy, the, the mother. Okay. In 1036, Edward and Alfred, his brother, arrived separately into England. Alfred was captured by Earl Goodwin of, Ex of Wessex. Earl Godwin had Alfred binded and turned over to Howard Harefoot. Harold Harefoot obviously thought himself was going to be crowned king, and that's what he wanted. Didn't want to give it up. So, at some point, we don't know who and we don't know when, but Alfred is blinded, supposedly by hot pokers in the eyes. I find that a little bit of a struggle to believe, given that the Scandinavians, particularly the Varangian Guard, had been blinding people with acid for hundreds of years by that stage. Um, so I don't see why it would have been necessary to use hot pokers. All right, anyway, Alfred then dies of his injuries within weeks, and most likely uh, that was the source of his hatred towards the Godwins. Clearly this is a key trigger for what happens in the years to come. Edward was have said to have survived an ambush somewhere near Southampton, but he was able to retreat to Normandy. Again, we, we don't really know uh, very much about that. How, in 1037, Howard Harefoot accepts, uh, is accepted as king and expels Emma of Normandy, who then demands an invasion. Edward has no resources to assist and this then becomes a big contention. From her point of view, Emma of Normandy would have wanted to be essentially the Queen Mother because that would have had, uh, provided her with much better accommodation, much better food, much better household staff and obviously much better money. In 1040, 
Harold Harefoot dies and Half Canute takes the crown. However, Harold Harefoot at this stage is an old man, uh, especially by early medieval standards. And he was also sick and he was also aware that his time on earth was coming to an end. In 1041, he invites Edward to England, uh, essentially as his heir. In 1041, Edward the Confessor is crowned the English king and he meets with his three leading earls. That is Earl Godwin, Earl Leofric of Mercia and Earl Siward of Northumbria. Now, if you remember, that this is the very same Earl Godwin that assassinated, essentially, uh, or is, is linked to the assassination of Alfred, uh, Edward the Confessor's brother. So there's obviously a lot of uh, emotional tension going on here. 1043. Edward rode out with his three leading earls to reclaim treasure from his mother, Emma. But Emma refuses and there's a long standoff that goes on. In 1052, Emma of Normandy dies. 1043, Earl Godwin's eldest son, Swain, is appointed Earl of the Southwest Midlands. 1045, Edward marries Edith, Godwin's daughter. So the Godwins now are essentially becoming um, a, an incredibly powerful family throughout England. Harold Godwin becomes Earl in the same year. So by this stage, the Godwins themselves rule over more of England, essentially, than the king does. If you take the king, doesn't really have much of his own power base. He doesn't have much of his own military and he doesn't have um, essentially much of his own land per se. So his land is essentially ruled by earls that are essentially in a um, an early version of the fealty system. Radio 1047 Swain is banished. Uh, he's basically um, accused of holding an abbess of Lear Smith as essentially a sex hostage and Swain later murders his cousin um, Bjorn. However in 1048 and this would have to be the the amount of power that Godwins are wielding at this stage in 1048 Swain is reinstated. There must have been an extraordinary amount of power. You have to understand that, that Edward the Confessor was uh, an incredibly pious person, or is said to have been a very pious person. He spent most of his time devoted to the church. He spent a lot of his money devoting to the church. So for someone to take an abbess, a high-ranking female official in the church, and keep her essentially as a sex slave, and then murder uh, his own cousin, and then that same person to be reinstated has to demonstrate uh, the considerable amount of power the Godwins were wielding. As I say, Edward the Confessor had very little of his own power base and he doesn't seem to have ever really attempted to build one. Strange, because he feared invasion. Um, many of the nobles in England at this time were openly discussing invading England. That included King Magnus of Norway, it included uh, King Svein of Denmark. It included uh, Harold Hadrada. It included, uh, obviously, William Duke of Normandy, as well as several dukes from uh, other areas in France, including Flanders. Edward appointed uh, quite a number of Normans into the court. Now, that's obviously to do with his many, many years in exile and the considerable amount of influence the these uh, Normans seem to have developed and most of these Normans were very unpopular because they had very very strong and opposing beliefs to compare with um, 
the Saxons. Somewhere around the year 1051, Edward elects Robert de Jumiège as Archbishop. Eustace of Boulogne, Edward's brother, um, essentially invades. Now, I'm using that word very loosely, but essentially what happened is this occurred in the territory of the Godwins. A, a significant amount of a fray seems to have occurred and the town's burgesses, that is the town's folk or the town's townspeople, have a significant sort of skirmish with uh, the, the followers of Eustace of Boulogne. Clearly this is an orchestrated event, very tactfully done because it's designed to achieve a very specific outcome. I say that speculative and speculatively and there's no real evidence for it, but I would argue that the circumstances prove it in itself. Edward the Confessor orders Earl Godwin to rebuke and bring the town's burgesses to justice and Earl Godwin refuses because um, clearly they were simply defending themselves. There is then a considerable standoff with Earl Godwin on one side essentially with his men and the king with the other earls on the other. The result is the Godwins are then forced into exile and Swain goes on pilgrimage but dies on his return. In 1053 Godwin returns with an army. He's supported this time by other earls. The other earls being Leofric and Swad have seen and realized that if the king can do this to one of his strongest earls, and let's, as I said, um, this is Earl Godwin, who essentially controlled far more of England than the king did. So, if the king can do that to someone like him, he can do it to anybody. That would have created a considerable amount of fear, so there was then a standoff, and Earl Godwin returns with his family and his retainers. The French now flee because they realise what's about to happen. They fear Godwin's res uh, response. Godwin, having been accused of murdering the king's brother, um, and if that was true, then um, all of these French nobles would have been uh, in the line for the same kind of treatment. So Robert de Jumierge flees England. However, he kidnaps Harold Godwin's youngest brother and one of his nephews on the way out and is also said to have murdered a bunch of other Saxons as he left. So considerably, this is a, a churchman, a statesman, in fact an archbishop um, being involved directly in murder. So this is the kind of person we're talking about here. Earl Godwin dies late that year and is succeeded by his son Harold. In 1055 there's a succession of deaths. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing, so bear with me. So, Swad dies, but his son is too young to rule, so Tostic then takes on his earldom. Leofric and his son Ralph die. Aelfgar, Leofric's son, succeeds him as Earl of Mercia. Harold's brother Gerth succeeds Aelfgar uh, as Earl in East Anglia and Leofric gets the earldom of South East England. The Godwins now essentially control all of England except Mercia. In 1056, Harold is sent to Hungary to return a, a relative of Edward the Confessor to be his successor upon death. However, this man dies essentially within weeks of coming to England. This is the key event that the Normans conveniently forget. The Welsh now threaten to invade England. A series of raids take place around Shropshire and other areas of um, the Welsh borders. In retaliation, Edward the Confessor builds a series of Motton Bailey castles. These are very strategic uh, castles which are put in place basically to be able to uh, not only provide 
local administration. They are also the primary residence of the local commander, uh, usually an earl, and they also provide um, places for the military to cache weapons and equipment and supplies uh, for response to these raids. Malcolm of Canmore is in exile inside Edward's court and his father Duncan I is killed by men loyal to Macbeth. That is the Macbeth out of the William Shakespeare poems. Alrightio, Harold Godwin has now proved himself to be a um, key statesman. He's proven himself to be a very strategic tactician and he's proven himself to be a very effective military commander. As a statesman, he's been able to negotiate um, the retrieval of a relative of Edward the Confessor to be his um, successor. He's proven himself to be loyal Earl by being able to do these sorts of tasks and not put himself in the prime position. He's been able to repel and respond to all sorts of military incursions uh, and lead his military. So he's a very, very skilled and accomplished person. Griffith, uh, that's the Welsh prince, continues his raids around England. And Harold, and Harold Godwin is forced to march a sizable army. This is kind of a primitive version of, I suppose, um, you know, a lightning raid. <coughs> Harold Godwin is able to take massive amounts of ground and conduct raids simultaneously across uh, Wales, but Grithand allies himself with the Earl of Mercia. Harold now has to launch further raids and he's showing that he can be an adaptive military leader. Griffith eventually is killed by his own men and his head is sent in a box to Earl Godwin. Earl Godwin, uh, his head is sent in a box to Earl Harold Godwin. Harold Godwin has now proven himself essentially invaluable uh, and he's loved by the king despite his father's um, uh, atrocities basically or what his father is linked to. Tostic is accused by uh, men loyal to the king of murdering 200 plus followers and conspiracy against the king. When challenged, Tostic accused Harold of conspiring with the Welsh rebels. We've uh, covered Tostic in a separate video, so please feel free to click here to follow that a bit closer. In December 28th, 1065, Edward was too weak to see. In 1064, Harold is sent on a diplomatic mission to France. Now there's three different ways of looking at this and clearly the Normans have put forward their view which essentially is designed to support their cause for war. Radio, the Normans perceive it as Harold was sent to reaffirm his promise that Duke William would be king. That's forgetting the fact that hostages were taken by Robert de Jumierge, which was Harold Godwin's brother and cousin. And it's possible, this being the second scenario, that Harold Godwin was sent to secure their release, quite possibly on his own accord. Now there's the third scenario here. The third scenario is quite possibly correct in that, in the early 1060s, how, um, William Duke of Normandy was already declaring publicly that he was going to succeed Edward the Confessor as King of England. And it's quite possible that the English, knowing the, the, the French use of heavy cavalry, started to realise that an invasion from Normandy was likely. So it is possible that 
Harold Godwin was sent on a diplomatic mission to Flanders to try and destabilise the Norman power base. However, we'll never know the truth, but my, my belief is that Harold Godwinson was actually on his way to Flanders and may have even tried to visit other principalities and earldoms in France to try to take away the power base from the Normans. In 1065, however, now we all know that this mission goes absolutely awry from the start. Harold, at the very least, is blown off course and he is captured almost immediately by a French noble. The French noble then hands him over to uh, William, Duke of Normandy, who then holds Harold effectively prisoner for about a year and a half and only releases Harold after Harold has sworn an oath to him. Now, Harold had no real option. Harold had to get back to England uh, to serve his king. That's what his job and his function was. So it's absurd, really, to, to think that he, Harold would have done anything else. Um, but I, I certainly don't think Harold had any real intention of going through with what he promised. But he also would have known that this, this choice would have had immense consequences. In 1065, Tostic accuses uh, the retainers of Edward the Confessor then accuse Tostic of being complicit in the murder of 200 plus followers and conspiring against the king. <coughs> Tostic accuses Harold of conspiring with the rebels and there's no real easy solution here. Tostic's lands, his earldom in Northumbria, has become absolutely unstable and a rebellion has ensued. The only real option that Harold Godwinson had was to expel Tostic. Tostic, uh, we know, was furious and we'll talk about Tostic in a separate video. However, it's important to understand that um, Edward the Confessor now was an incredibly weak old man. He and he became very sick around this point. In the 3rd of October 1065, a rebellion ensued. And the, the rebels demanded that Earl Tostic be replaced by Lady Godiva's nephew. Tostic was exiled and ran to Flanders with his wife Judith of Flanders. He would have... Um, gained a great deal of support in Flanders and it's we don't really know who he saw or when he saw them it's inevitable I think that he had discussions with uh, William Duke of Normandy and other people at the time because it certainly wasn't just William Duke of Normandy who had his eye on the English throne and William Duke of Normandy may very well have seen Tostic as being a useful ally at least temporarily, uh, for his planned invasion, because at this stage he was already relatively well in advance uh, with his plans for invasion. Radio, let's talk about Edward the Confessor's legacy. Edward the Confessor, Edward the Confessor, moved the English powerhouse from Wessex to Westminster. For those of you who haven't been to England, that's a fairly considerable distance but it's more strategic and I think this was largely um, in line with suggestions or persuasions by the French cleric uh, William of Jumiège. I think also it's fair to say that um, because the, the cathedrals in Jumiège and in, La in Westminster were, were very, very similar. And so, unfortunately, it's impossible to know which was built first and which essentially was the copy. Although the, uh, 
the cathedral that was built was eventually knocked down a couple of hundred years later. But there we go. Uh, it's, it's important to understand that Edward the Confessor now also um, created modern London as we see it today because of the power base that was moved there. And this would have been, I guess, um, in line with French persuasion. It had a lot to do with uh, the, the, the rivers in London provided much greater access, much easier access for uh, ships coming in from the continent. I think now we also need to talk about the succession. A lot of people accuse Harold Godwinson of stealing the throne or usurping the throne as it's technically called. Uh, I think that's a load of rubbish. Um, Harold Godwinson had proved himself to be utterly invaluable. Uh, Harold Godwinson had proved himself to be a, a, a master tactician, a military leader, a very successful commander. He had proven himself to be a very successful statesman, able to deal with internal rebellions and the potential for external invasion. He had also shown a great deal of diplomacy and leadership and loyalty to the crown through his dealings with um, his brothers and family. I think if you consider the alternatives, Harold Godwinson was the really only uh, suitable heir to Edward the Confessor and I do believe that uh, that would have been recognised by the nobles at the time. In fact what happened in, in the English monarchy in those days was that the Witten, essentially the parliament of the day, had to vote you in as king. In other words you didn't have the right to be king simply through the hereditary means that we tend to associate with royal families today. Instead, uh, the Witten had to acknowledge and, and believe, and for the most part, not always, but for the most part, um, the Witten did follow the hereditary line. However, Edward the Confessor didn't have a son. He didn't have any children. In fact, it's believed that he was so pious to the Lord that he never had sex in his marriage. Now, we don't know if that's true or not. Um, in many respects, he seems to have been a very sort of contemporary leader of his day. He certainly was no military man. He was no fighter as such, but he was um, definitely contemporary in so many regards. So we don't know whether he had sex or not, and we don't know uh, if that was the cause of him not having children. Perhaps he was impotent. Uh, the point is there was a succession crisis. And this was the worst possible period in history to have a crisis because there were so many people who saw themselves as a suitable or potential heir to the English throne. We had threats of invasion from Denmark, from Norway, from Normandy, from Flanders and from a variety of other states in continental Europe. So a successor had to be named very quickly. Edward the Confessor dies and literally on the same day Harold Godwinson is essentially voted in by the Witten. It is important to acknowledge however that the Witten was heavily stacked, heavily dominated by relatives of Harold Godwinson and the Godwins essentially commanded the whole of England through their own earldoms with the exception of Mercia. So we have a real crisis here and we have a if you like, an unfair bias. But that's the situation that they had at the time. Who were the alternatives inside the English kingdom? I suppose you could regard the Earl of Mercia or the Earl of Northumbria as possible alternatives. They certainly saw themselves as alternatives. That being um, Earl Edwin. We simply don't know really how the Witten had viewed these people. We have a, a, a very fragmented and limited amount of information of this, da of this time. So Harold Godwinson was uh, chosen. He believed himself to be nominated by the king on his deathbed. Whether that happened or not, we don't know. But the fact is he was a legitimate king because 
that Witten had voted for him. Harold Godwinson is coronated the same day as Edward the Confessor dies. Now we'll finish this video with a quick note. Now within a few days, within a few days, so it, it may have taken a day for a rider to, from, to go from London to the coast, another day to get across the channel, a third day to get into Normandy and possibly a fourth day to actually locate the Duke of Normandy. So it's very fair to say that within four days the Duke of Normandy, William, heard about this. The Chronicles tell us that William, the Duke of Normandy, didn't take this well. Understatement. He um, apparently went into his... he was hunting at the time. He then um, basically was very sad and depressed for a day and later that afternoon he called a council of war. Now we, we also know for a fact that at, for at least 10 years William Duke of Normandy had planned his invasion of England so this isn't kind of uh, you know a sudden kind of thing for him this was just really an excuse to go to war and war was the means for him in, in his opinion to claim what he saw as being rightfully his, but it was the, the, the mechanism for him to, it was the mechanism for William to achieve the crown of England. We'll cover the invasion of England uh, in a series of other videos and also I want to talk at length about William the Conqueror because he's a very fascinating character in history. Anyway guys, today thank you very very much for watching the video. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. I hope it was useful. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.